All right, thank you. The power of the cross. Yes. I want to just thank all the visitors for being here today. And actually, I'm going to change to this one, Mike, for just a second. I'm uh, going to do something I don't always do. And I've been here six months today. Deb and I drove into Radcliffe six months today. And we appreciate the church and putting up with us and being your pastor. And if you're visiting here today, I want to thank you again for coming. And so we just appreciate you being here today. And, and we want to have a good time in the Lord today. And yes, children, you already know that because you're already leaving. I forget this all the time. Children can go to children's church. And, and uh, I'm a little slow, but I catch on. After about the 10th kid that drives by here. So uh, I want you to listen to the... There we go. I, uh, I want you to listen to the words of this song. Great, great message. And as we look at this song, and I'm going to try not to mess up the words or get too carried away with what the words are, because if I think about them too long, I'll start thinking about them in my mind and forget about what's coming next. And so, but the name of it is, My House is Full, and usually uh, beside that title says, My Fields are Empty. This song's about 40 years old. I remember, in, I think, 1977 when it came out, and... Uh, I'm old enough to remember that and be an adult and sing back then. So, uh, But I just want you to listen to the words of this song. There is peace and contentment in my father's house today lots of food on the table and no one is turned away there is singing and laughing as the hours pass by but a hush comes the singing as the father sadly cries my house is full but my fields are empty oh who will come and go work for me today it seems my children all want to stay around my table and no one wants to work in my fields no one wants to work in my fields push away from the table Look out through the window pane Just beyond the house of plenty Lies a field of golden grain And it's wide unto the harvest But the reapers, where are they? In the house, oh can't the children Hear the Father sadly say My house is full But my fields are empty Oh, who will come and go For me today It seems my children all want to stay around my table but no one wants to work in my field no one wants to work in my field That's what we're going to talk about today. All right. 
We're going to be in Mark the ninth chapter starting in verse 35. You know, there's something about being in God's house. And, and I don't want you to get this wrong. I, I love it when people come into God's house and want to worship God. But folks, if we don't have a lifestyle outside of the house of God, I don't believe we have much of a relationship with God. And what we need to have is that relationship with God that we're willing to do anything that we need to do, first of all, to bring other people to Christ. You know, when I, when I was growing up, we had this little country church that had those wooden pews. And uh, I, I would say that I was a mischievous child, but that would be an understatement. And I remember I even got in trouble a couple of times, and I got to polish those pews. That was, uh, you know, that's kind of what they did. They'd make you do stuff around the church and think that would help you. Maybe you'd think about God. No, I thought about all the people sitting in the pews. Why'd they make this mess? Who's putting them scratches in there? I've got to clean this up because they didn't do it. I have to admit, my, my mind wasn't right, all right? But as I would clean those pews, and I can remember cleaning pews, I can remember that, because there wasn't anybody around watching, so I'd clean those pews, and I'd get them all shiny, and, and I'd rub them down, and then I'd back up about 10 feet, and to make sure that they were good, I would run and just slide all the way from one end to the other. You know, hit the side and almost knock it out. And, and I thought that was great fun, but folks, I wanted to, and we have padded pews, so you don't have to worry about that, kids. You'll get to do other stuff you mess up enough, all right? But, and they all went out anyway, so what good did this do? But I want to tell you, we don't need pew polishers anymore, polishing by the seat of their pants. We need people that get off, off the padded pews and do the work of God in the community. All right? Now that might come to a shock to you. I hope not. But we're going to be in Mark 5, starting, excuse me, Mark 9, starting with verse 35. All right? He sat down and called the twelve disciples over to him and said, Whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. See, we've lost track of this. Now he's calling over his disciples and I know all of you will say, Well listen, he's talking to the disciples. Folks, I want to tell you something. If you don't consider yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ to go out and do the work of God, there's something wrong. So now he tells us very clearly here in his word. He calls over his disciples and he says the first must be last. Now some of you think last means do nothing. That is not the case. What that means is you've got to put other people before you. There's a lot of times people don't want to get up and go to church. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I bet you there's some of you every Sunday morning besides my wife that says that. <laughs> All right? I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, if there's a harder time to get up, you'll get up and go to work early in the morning to a job because they pay you and they're going to fire you. But when it comes to serving our Lord and Savior, we have a hard time getting to church on time. That means you might love the money that comes from your job more than you do the Savior of the world. We ought to come into the house of God to be fed to get juvenated so that you and I might do the work of God throughout the week. So, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. I just hate to tell you, but we live in a world today that everybody thinks about me, 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 me. My, 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 my. And what we ought to be concerned about are other people in the world that are lost and dying and going to hell. We ought to be concerned about people that don't have as much as we have and we want to help them get through life, but help them know the reason we do it is because we have Jesus Christ in our hearts. We go to verse 36. Then he put a little child among them, took a little child among them, taking the child in his arms. He said to them, Anyone who becomes a little child like this on my behalf welcomes me. All right? And anyone who welcomes me welcomes not only me, but also my Father who sent me. You know, I've heard more people talk about snotty-nosed little kids than just about anything else in church. 
Well, you don't want to bring those little kids in here. They're liable to break something. You don't want to bring them kids in here. They make noise. They ain't got no training. I know that's not good English, but you all get the point. Now, these folks down here can tell you, I've told people for years, if these kids stir up this church, we can replace it. And I'm not saying that we let them in to do that. Don't get me wrong, but what I am saying, you and I need to understand something. If they're not in here, we don't have a church of tomorrow. All right? We're going to have to start doing something to get people in here and love them enough that they'll stay in here and that they'll see the hand of God working in here that they might want to grow up in this church. And 30 years from now, you won't have to worry about a dead church. You'll worry about a church that's alive and where they're going to put everybody else. Verse 36, John said to Jesus, teach us. Teacher, we saw one using your name to cast out demons. But we told him to stop because he wasn't in our group. <laughs> doesn't that sound like Christians? I mean, really, doesn't it? Well, you know, they don't believe exactly the way we do. They got a few differences. Folks, let me tell you something. If they have a plan of salvation and accept Jesus Christ in their heart as personal Lord and Savior, they're saved and you're going to have to spend eternity with them in heaven. All right, and you say, well, pastor, they believe things we don't believe. Hey, well, let me just tell you something. Let's get, try to get right what little we know about God and forget about what other people are doing. Let's get our own lives right with him. Let's do what God has called us to do in him. Quit worrying about everybody else and worry about where you stand in your walk with Jesus Christ. I'm sorry if some of that's a little hard hitting. I'm really not sorry. It's the word of God. If it offends you, you got a problem. All right, if it steps on your toes, you got a problem. Don't take it out on everybody else. And as my brother-in-law says, don't blame it on God. All right. He tells me that every once in a while. So, You know, I found out a long time ago. I mentioned to somebody earlier. I said, you need to say that in a, in a sermon. I said, well, that's no problem. I found out a long time ago. When you shoot a shotgun and a pack of dogs, the one that yelps is the one that got hit. And, and I want to tell you something. In churches today, we got a lot of yelping Christians. Oh, I want to tell you, they'll gripe about anything and everything. You know, you all know, most people say, how you doing? I said, I don't know, tell me after the sermon. And some of you are good at it. And that's all right, I can take it. My wife will tell you, I'm like a duck when water runs off my back. I mean, God is... Sometimes God will take me to my knees and because it's something that's true and I ask God if it's true, he'll take me to my knees. I'll tell you something. You want to get through to this preacher, get on your knees and pray that God would straighten me out. Amen. Because there's a good chance you can't. But we need to love each other enough to show God's love to a lost world. We're going to go to John chapter 4 verse 34. Then Jesus explained... This is after he'd met there with the woman at the well. And they went and got him something to eat. And they're coming back. He said, then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God. Let me ask you, does your nourishment come? And you say, I'm not talking about food here. I'm talking about your spiritual nourishment. Does it come from doing the will of God? If not, then we need to be doing the will of God more in our lives. Because let me tell you something. As you all know, I started preaching over 45 years ago. I've been pastoring over 35 years. I've been on church staffs and pastoring that long. But I want to tell you, I've always heard of burnout. I can't tell you how many people say, Pastor, you're going to burn out. They told me that when I was in my 20s. You're going to burn out. You can't keep going like that. I'm 62 and I never burn out. You know why? I don't focus on people. I focus on God. And you say, you think that works, Pastor? No, I know it works. I think when we focus on God and what God wants to do in our hearts and lives, we won't burn out. If anything, our light will get stronger for him. 
And you may be sitting there, but Pastor, I don't have the energy. I'm old right now. But let me tell you something. You can be some of the greatest prayer warriors on the face of this earth. We got some folks going around right now praying for streets. We got other people that are supposed to be going out and knocking on doors. And some of them are and appreciate it. And some of them haven't started yet. But I want to tell you, God will bless you when you get started. He says, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me. And from finishing his work. Man, I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about you, but when God called me to this church when I was 61, six months ago, Deb and I's prayers have been, God, I don't know how long you want me here, but I'll be here as long as you want. But the main thing is, oh Lord, I want to finish strong for you. Glory. Folks, I want to tell you, if you don't want to finish strong for our God, then you don't understand who our God is. Verse 35 says, you know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up and look around. Jesus is saying this, wake up and look around. Now that's not just here in the church, folks. Let me tell you, it's pretty obvious on Sundays, people in church know something about God or are searching for God. That's the reason they're in the church. But when we, just like that song says, when we, we need to push ourselves away from the table, we need to get out and look out the window pane and see the harvest that is plentiful. He says, but I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. If you don't think the fields are ripe for harvest, and I haven't been able to find these numbers, I wish I could. I'd be willing to say, though, that even in the Bible Belt, less than 20% of people are in God's house today. I don't know of too many churches that I've heard of in this area that are over full and flowing over. There's a couple, but there's a lot of churches here. And the problem is we quit growing because I believe we quit doing what God told us to do. We've quit inviting. We've quit talking to people about Jesus. And you say, oh, well, pastor, you can't do that like you used to. Hey, nobody enjoyed doing it then either. But I want to tell you, you can get them where they'll ask you questions that you can answer. You can knock on their door and leave them something and then pray that there'll be a divine appointment by the Holy Spirit to touch their hearts and that they might seek God's face. I want to tell you, the field are already ripe to the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages. You say, wait just a second. I'm, Pastor, you're the only one making money to go out and do that. Well, you and the staff. Folks, let me tell you something. Really, our job is to enable you to be able to do that. And, and, and tell you how to do that. Say, good wages? I want to tell you something. I tell everybody. Being a pastor doesn't mean you make a great living and that you're going to be able to retire with millions of dollars. Well, there's a few of those, but they're on TV, and I'm not even sure some of them know the Lord, all right? So, what, what I want to say today is, though, I tell people all the time, my wages are out of this world. My blessings are out of this world. And I want to tell you, when you and I are doing the will of God and we're knocking on doors and we're telling people about Jesus and we're having information about a church and inviting them to God's house, I want to tell you, God blesses us that and there's heavenly rewards for it. Amen. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. Man, we ought to care about people dying and going to hell. We ought to care about people and we ought to be there to give them something about Jesus. Yes. What joy awaits both the planter, you get this? What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. I don't care if you're planting seed or if you get to have a harvest. Folks, I know a lot of you, I think there's been about two or 3,000 of these true life dot our cards given out so far I praise God that you're giving these cards out and I want to tell you when we give these cards out at the door or we put a door knocker on the door that has all the information about the church you're planting seeds and that's what we're called to do is plant seeds for the kingdom 
We go on in God's word and it says, you know the saying, one plants and another one harvests, and it's true. Verse 38 says, I send you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others have already done the work. And now you will get together the harvest. There's times. Let me tell you, when you go to somebody and you tell them about Jesus, there's a lot of times they'll just walk away and say, oh, I don't need it. I was raised in church. You know, I say it all the time. Being raised in church doesn't make you any more of a Christian. It's sitting in your garage makes you a car. And you and I need to understand that just because a person comes to church, and don't you assume that everybody in this building knows Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Just because a person comes to church and looks churchy and acts churchy and sounds churchy doesn't know they have a personal relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we need to be praying and asking God. He's already gave us the fields white to harvest. I want to ask you, what have we been doing to plant the seed? As we've looked at all these verses today. I want to tell you it's true. Now listen, our churches aren't all full. But we like to sit around the table and hear the word of God. But somehow there's a disconnect in doing the will of God in our life. You know if you sit around the table. And that's all you want to do is sit around the table. It has done you no good. You say, oh pastor, it's done me tremendous amount of good I've grown so much in the Lord let me give you this if you've grown that much in the Lord you'll be out doing God's work right. say pastor that's pretty hard hitting hey I you know what I find out almost every time I read the word of God I get convicted about something in my life and you say well pastor that's because you're so messed up well guess what I believe you are too <laughs> all right <laughs> we're all messed up we need the word of God we need to open the word of God and read it and apply it to our lives. And we need to take passages of scriptures like these and say, I'm not going to run away. I'm going to run to the Lord and do whatever he asked me to do. You know, we're in churches today. People gripe about everything. I've heard in the last two or three weeks from people, they didn't mention any names, all right? But said, do you know how many people are griping about watching the nursery or serving our children? I don't even want to know. I've heard it. For over 40 years. There's not anything that has less people lined up to do than nursery, children, and youth. Almost anywhere you go, they're begging people to work in those areas. I'll miss a service. I know you'll miss a service, but let God bless you. Matter of fact, when you're with them children, tell them about Jesus. When you're with them children, sing Christian songs to them. Even if it's the old stuff, they don't know. Sing whenever you know. We need people to teach Sunday school classes to do other things. I want to tell you, we need people here in this building. We don't all just need to sit here every Sunday morning. We ought to be able to get fired up and say, God, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. My worst nightmare is that when I'm dead and gone, Stifton Baptist Church won't be full and overflowing with Christians that love the Lord. There's been nothing worse in my ministry to leave a church and go back years later. And that church didn't keep on growing, but went backwards. I can't hardly go back. My wife will tell you, I don't, I don't want to go back. It's painful. Stifton Baptist Church I pray this all the time, and you know it, and you've heard me say it. I pray every day that God would make Stitham Baptist Church the church he created her to be. And to do that, he needs to make us the person he created us to be. And I'm going to ask you, don't continue just doing whatever you've done. I'm going to ask you to take another step forward. I'm going to ask you to do things that maybe you haven't done before. You did them years ago. And I've learned around here I have to ask the question when somebody said we did that before. I have to say how long ago was that? Because it wasn't in the last few weeks. We need to start over for God and we need to say God forgive us. God make us make me who you want me to be that I might go out and lead people to you and tell people about you and then invite them to God's house. And let me tell you when you knock on the door of somebody 
somebody, if they say they're actively involved in a Bible-believing church, you praise the Lord with them and say, hang in there, keep with it. You, we are not here to take people from other churches. I do not believe in swapping fish in fish bowls. Nobody gets any better off. What we need are born again Christians that are out of God's will coming back to God's house and people that don't know Jesus to come and receive Christ as Lord and Savior that God's house might become the house that they want to serve him in. It's about time we do do push away from the table. We look out. And we ask God to open your spiritual eyes. We talked about that just a week or so ago. To open our spiritual eyes and see that there's lost people dying in this community because of without Jesus, because maybe somebody hasn't told them about God. I ask God to put a burden in all of our hearts that we might be the church God created us to be. I'll tell you the truth. Confession time for me, I've said for years and years, and, and some of you heard this. God, I'll never pastor in the Bible Belt again. I'm guilty of that. You know, guess what? I'm here. I've, I should have learned to quit telling God things I won't do because every one of them I've had to do. And I praise God for bringing us here because I know God put us here. But church, we got to wake up. We got to serve a living Savior. And we got to do, and don't worry about what everybody else isn't doing. Worry about what he's called you to do. Glory. And what he's called me to do. You and I can look at other people and feel good about ourselves all day long. But when we look at our example, Jesus Christ, let me tell you, it'll make you think things over again. So I'm going to ask you, are you willing today to say, Lord, I'm going to be more faithful to your house. Lord, I'm going to be more faithful to you. Lord, I'm going to be more faithful in doing what I need to do. I'm going to hand out some of them cards this week. I was doing it before and I kind of backed off. But I'm going to hand out some of those cards this week. I'm going to go with some of them door knockers. And I'm going to sign up with somebody else that's got a team going out and visit and knock on doors. And you say, well, Pastor, do you really expect a lot of results? Let me tell you what I expect. I expect God to do a work in our hearts because we're doing what he's told us to do. And I know that God will bless it. I won't tell him how to bless it because I found out he doesn't listen to me that much. He already knows what he wants. But I'm going to ask you today, would you come and maybe you know you've been living out of the will of God. Maybe you know that your heart's not right with God. Would you come and get that right with him today? Maybe you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Would you ask him to come into your heart today? I want to tell you, he gave us life on Mount Calvary that you and I might be saved. Would you accept him today? It's the difference of spending eternity if you were to die today in hell or eternity in heaven. Maybe today you just need to pray for some friends that are lost and you know it and family members. Maybe today you just need to spend some time with God because you haven't been spending a lot of time with God lately. But I'm going to ask you, Stithen Baptist Church, and you are visiting. And by the way, if you're visiting here, this altar belongs to God. It doesn't belong to this church. You come and get anything right with God that you need to get right with God because that's what it's all about. I'm going to have a word of prayer in just a moment. Our musicians are going to come. and We're going to have a time of invitation. I'm going to ask that God speaks to the hearts of everyone here today. And we'll do whatever the Spirit of God is leading us to do. And we'll obey the Spirit promptly in our hearts today. So would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that you loved us enough to send your Son to die on the cross for us. And your word's pretty clear, Lord, that the world is ripe for harvest. And Father, I ask you right now, that you would take any fear away, Lord, and replace it with your love in our hearts. Father, that we wouldn't just go out of here and say, well, I agree with everything there, but I just can't do it. I would ask us to say, Lord, I, help me, give me the strength to do what you've asked us to do. 
And then find a way to do it. So, Father, we praise you for who you are. If there's anyone lost here, they would come to know you as Lord and Savior. Anybody needs to rededicate that life, that they would rededicate it to you. And anyone that just needs to come and pray, Lord, they would come and pray and give everything they have to you today. Father, I pray if there's anyone that needs to make this church or church home, that you would help them come today. Father, we just praise you because you are almighty God. Now, Father, I pray that you would do a work within us like never before. Thank you, Lord, for saving us. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving our sins. Now, Father, stir our hearts today. Open our blinded eyes that we might see what you have for us today. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.